Okay. So um, I've returned um, your first two assignments. They're in your mailboxes. Um, uh, there may be some tweaking uh, because I'm giving point values for things and I may adjust some of the point values. Uh, Cindy, get your questions in as soon as you can. Those of you who need more time today, uh, somebody has asked already, so that's okay. Um, some of you uh, didn't answer questions or answered questions um, in an incorrect way. Uh, you didn't understand the question or something. So you can uh, resubmit some things. Um, we're gonna go over a couple of things right now, but we should still uh, um, try to keep up with uh, correct answers. Part of the goal of this is for you to learn. It's not just, okay, you did that wrong, X. Uh, I want you to try to learn something from this and uh, re-answering questions and getting credit or partial credit is part of the process. Okay, so I also mentioned at the end of class last time that I was sort of unhappy with uh, what I did last week. <clears throat> um, when you write on a board, when I write on a board, I like chalk, actually. Um, there's something that is more organized in terms of standing there in front of you and writing it all out. And the Wacom works fine on some, in some settings, but I think that in general, it's not working as well as I had hoped it would. It works well, I think, when I have a PowerPoint and I'm writing on the PowerPoint. And so that's something that uh, we're going to have to work on. Um, that I'm going to have to work on. Uh, and so I'll be changing that up as we go along here. I think every single class will be a, <clears throat> a test. OK, so let's close that. Let's share screen. Okay, and then let's open up the PowerPoint. So this is posted. Um, although I'm already making little tweaks to it and I'll make tweaks today and then I'll, I'll post uh, this version of it, especially this whatever I write on it. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over a couple of the, the questions um, because I'd like to make something clear that hasn't been clear. In part, I haven't gone over everything. Uh, some of this is meant to be a learning experience. The reason I asked you to read Siegel, the reason John asked you to read Siegel and Creighton, et cetera, is so that you learn a little more detail than we might introduce when we talk. So there's a couple of things that were obviously not clear. Uh, and then we'll go through some of Creighton's chapter four. I know John has already got this posted and he's saying some things out of it. I'm not gonna do the whole chapter. There are other things at the end of the chapter that I'll revisit when we introduce them in other lectures. And then we're gonna finish with um, this hydropathy scale. Uh, specifically, we're gonna talk about Kite and do do little. Is that misspelled? That's misspelled, isn't it? Hmm. Uh, hold on a second. Do I have that open? I don't have it open. Hmm. It's probably misspelled. Yeah, hello. Yeah, it's misspelled. I thought it was misspelled. <laughs> Goodness. Okay. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and I'll try to introduce why that is sort of a big topic. And uh, I'll give you a better impression of it, hopefully, when I'm lecturing. 
Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is um, this question. So 5e in the first problem set, and this is coming from Siegel, you add five times 10 to the minus eight molar HCl. I think that's 50 nanomolar. So you had, so you had 50 nanomolar to water. And um, the question is, what's the pH? What's the pOH? What's the number of particles of protons and hydroxides, et cetera? That's what that series was. So the point is, in thinking about it, that you just added a strong acid to water. So you expect the solution to be acidic. If you take minus the log of five times 10 to the minus eight, you get 7.3. That's not acidic, that's basic. Slightly basic, but it's basic. What's the problem? Well, the issue is that, the issue is, that you're adding it to water <clears throat> and water itself is a buffer. This is sort of introduced in the, um, the first part of, uh, in, the, in the first PowerPoint that I covered a while back, three lectures ago on uh, an introduction to pH. So water produces, pure water produces one times 10 to the minus seven molar proton. So that's already in the water. And generally speaking, that's such a small number that you neglect it. We don't talk about it. I don't introduce it in medical biochemistry because it goes beyond what I have time to cover. But strictly speaking, if you add a really small amount of a weak or strong acid or base to pure water, you've got to include the water in the calculation. So you start with one times 10 to the minus seven molar Proton, let me use this other device here. Okay, you start using one times 10 to the minus seven molar proton. And to that, you add 50 nanomolar. So the actual total concentration is the sum. So now when you take minus the log, you get 6.82, slightly acidic. The POH is slightly basic, and that's the answer. Now, there may be some adjusting that goes on when you do this because the acid you add may shift equilibria a little bit. And notice what I've done is I've assumed that the water is exactly neutral, but when you add acid to it, things obviously shift. And so should the contribution be exactly 0.1 micromolar, one times seven to the minus seven molar. But nonetheless, this is certainly closer than what the book answer is. And it's acidic, it's not, basic okay so you sometimes have to include the water in the calculation all right and so the correct way to analyze ph problems is not just to write down the reaction uh i'm writing this as a weak acid and base in that previous problem it's really uh hcl right, dissociating HCl, dissociating to a proton and a chloride ion. But whether you do this or this, this reaction with water is also part of the equation, part of the calculation. You have two simultaneous equations and you have to take them both into account. If I just gave you 10 to the minus eighth molar or some low concentration of a weak acid, you would have to do the similar thing. So you have to include the water, all right? Now, in this case, it's because you've had such a low concentration. Uh, often you can add high concentrations, but there's so low a pH that the water contribution begins to be a significant contribution. And I'm saying here three to 10, textbooks often say four to 10, um, you have to include the water equation as part of the reaction, okay? That isn't necessarily all you have to include. Uh, Siegel and other textbooks will also point out to you that there has to be some electroneutrality. 
Okay, generally speaking, I would tell you that salt uh, is a neutral salt. For example, if we also had sodium chloride here, if we had 100 millimolar or 150 millimolar sodium chloride, that's a neutral salt that it doesn't affect the pH. But in fact, it does affect the total charge. And so a third equation that you often have to introduce is charge neutrality. So as written as asked, we have protons in equilibrium with a weak acid or in equilibrium, if I had just done the first and the third equation up here, this would be a proton is equal to uh, the chloride ion plus the hydroxide ion. This electroneutrality also has to be obeyed. Okay, and so you have to take that into account as well. If you happen to titrate a weak acid with sodium hydroxide, for example, now you've added sodium ion. And so the electroneutrality equation is protons plus sodium is equal to the conjugate base plus hydroxide. Or if you had done this as a mixture, instead of titrating, you just mix a certain combination of the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. Now you have to take into account the charge neutrality. So in principle, there are always three, at least, equations that you have to take into account. You have to take into account whatever the chemistry is, strong acid, weak acid. You have to take into account water, and you have to take into account charge neutrality, okay? And so that's why that equation, that 5E, um, most of you actually got it wrong because you didn't take into account water, okay? All right, uh, number 55 in that same problem set had to do with the number of protons uh, released, I think it was, or bound. I can't remember how it was phrased. Going from oxy to deoxy or deoxy to oxy, okay? And the issue is, how many protons are bound in the presence of oxygen? How many protons are bound in the absence of oxygen? So this is the oxy form. This is the deoxy representation. What they're telling you is the pKs change. This is something that I spend a little bit of time in med biochemistry on uh, in the hemoglobin chapter, hemoglobin PowerPoint. And so the pKs change, okay? The pK changes from a deoxy pK of 8.18 to a oxy pK of 6.62, okay? Now, the way this question is phrased, notice that the ratio or the result, the pK minus, the pH minus the pK, because the, both of them have a pH of 7.4 because both of them are in, hypothetically, in plasma. One of them is minus 0.78, and one of them is plus 0.78. So it's basically an inverse ratio. It's one sixth or it's six over one, okay? And one of you actually did this as ratios, okay? But the question is really protonation. And so in this first example, it's six parts out of seven are protonated. And in the second example, it's one part out of seven is protonated. And so that's where the fraction protonated comes from, okay? And so going from deoxy to oxy, this is what ends up happening. You start with six sevenths, you subtract out one sixth, one, one seventh, excuse me, because it's one part out of seven, one seventh, one seventh, and you end up with a change of five sevenths. And again, most of you did this by some kind of an actual number that you're taking the log of, whatever one sixth ends up being, whatever six over one ends up being. The other way of doing this is to put point one six, six, seven over 1.1667 1. 1, or 6.026 over 7.026. 6. 
And that gives you the fraction unprotonated. And then you have to calculate what the difference is. Okay. And you get essentially the same thing. Down here, it's one over 7.026. And there's the one seventh with a small correction. And down here, it's a one over 1.1667. Okay. Uh, and so, as when I asked this question, and I've asked this question in med biochemistry, I changed the PKs so that you don't have exactly the same ratio in the oxy and the deoxy. I might make this a PK of eight and a PK of six, and then the numbers are completely different. And you really have to calculate what's the fraction protonated, the denominator, what's the fraction protonated, the denominator, and what the difference is, okay? All right, uh, all of you got the, um, the PCR question, um, but if you were to kind of set this up in a way that's analogous to what we're trying to do here, the original example, since this ratio gives you the log of two and it's added to the PK of the tris at room temperature, um, we're basically changing the temperature. So we're changing the temperature by this frat factor, this factor 0 0.003 per degree, and we're changing the PK. But what we're basically assuming is, is that the ratio doesn't change. This is the starting point, And there's a small shift that is negligible, but that shift is not negligible from the perspective of protons and perspective of pH, okay? And so the X value ends up being a really small value. Uh, this is how it would write it out in a molarity sense. I think this is 530 nanomolar, but nonetheless, that's a small value relative to millimolar concentrations of tris. Nonetheless, the pH changes by quite a bit and most of you got this. The other reason that I brought this up was um, a number of you start making approximations early in the calculations. You start throwing away digits right away, okay? So this is not 5.975, this is 5.97, okay? Or this is 5.98. Okay, and my recommendation is, is that you don't throw digits away too early in the calculation. You round off at the end of the calculation, not in the middle of the calculation, because it will change the final answer significantly or it can change it significantly. So make sure you don't start rounding off too early in the process, okay? Uh, I'm gonna give you credit probably, but I'm suggesting that you wait until the very end. If you look at that chapter that I went over, but I didn't cover every single section of it on, <coughs> excuse me, on error propagation, they talk about significant digits. And in that chapter, they suggest what I just said, don't throw digits away too early in the process. Wait until the end of the process. Okay. So in my um, PH lecture, lecture number one, I covered um, the PowerPoint from Med Biochem, and one of the slides in there looks like this. It discusses non-covalent interactions that are going to come up. Um, John is repeating all of this because he's talking about enzymes, and he's talking about all of the non-covalent interactions that are involved in enzyme activity. Um, I also talk about it in terms of protein-protein interactions. Uh, ligand binding is also part of it, uh, substrate binding. And so hydrogen bonding, electrostatic, van der Waals contacts or van hydrophobic effect. And down here, van der Waals forces. Uh, is there something more down below that? Yes, one to the sixth power. These are the primary non-covalent interactions we talk about. 
There's also this key light effect that actually Creighton talks about a little bit at the end of the chapter. I won't get to that today. John will talk about that. John already has talked about that because he's asking you to find um, the ligands when metals bind. He's asking you to figure out which what the ligands are for magnesium binding or something else. Okay, And so this is what John is talking about. It's known as or is called often a key light because okay, there are multiple ligands. But in any event, these are the things that we talk about. And I kind of do a real sort of sliding uh, cursory sort of discussion of this. Uh, John has gone into a little more detail, but again, we don't get really um, too mathematical and too detailed about this, okay? Creighton uh, begins to get quantitative about this, okay? And I'll warn you that it's a beginning of giving quantitative, okay? Um, he talks about the types of non-covalent interactions. He talks about the structure and properties of liquid water and how that, those properties uh, change the way that polypeptide chains behave because they're not only interacting within themselves, but they're also interacting with the water. So a lot of what we're talking about in macromolecules implicitly includes water and how water changes the question. Um, and so Creighton begins, these are sort of almost direct quotes out of the introduction to this chapter, that many of the forces that we're talking about are really the properties of the solvent more than they are intermolecular interactions. Okay, we usually stress this in terms of hydrophobic interactions, but that's what this is. Okay. Water's interactions with ions, dipoles, hydrogen bond donors and acceptors play a significant role in the interaction in the system. Okay. And the hydrophobic effect being the, the one that we often emphasize, but it's not the only one by any means. All right. And so this is sort of what this chapter is trying to cover or part of what this chapter tries to cover, okay? So <clears throat> it begins with a discussion of van der Waals radii, um, and it describes it in terms of short range repulsive interactions that increase with the inverse of the 12th power of the distance between the center of the two atoms. <clears throat> so, the idea here is, is to appreciate that atoms occupy impenetrable volume modeled as spheres and defined as van der Waals radii. Okay, so it's usually expressed as some kind of a range because the distance, so you can see here, a hydrogen is one to one and a half angstroms and oxygen is 1.4 to 1.7 because these radii are influenced by what they're binding to. Okay, there's a change in the electronic structure that affects this apparent radius. Okay, and so a lot of these radii are average values. Okay, and so these differences or these distances are the distances between what we what we treat as spheres. Okay, they're strictly speaking not spheres. They're strictly speaking electron density. Okay, they're strictly speaking quantum mechanical um, calculations. All right, but in the, in the context of the language that we use, the model treats everything as spheres. All right. And then when you go to actual um, molecules that are made up of combinations of these atoms, you now treat the sum of the van der Waals contacts. Okay, so the sum of the van der Waals contacts in these various uh, structures, um, a CH group, okay, a CH2, a CH3, become the sum of these van der Waals contacts built in some kind of a proper um, topology. And now we use those to calculate effective areas and effective volumes, all right? So when you're using RASMOL or some other program, it's taking these values and constructing, depending on the way you display it, uh, a space filling image that approximates this. How much is actually full? How much is actually empty? Is always sort of an open question. 
Okay, it's a mathematical and it's a pictorial representation that is an approximate reflection of what the van der Waals contact distances are. Okay. Now, Creighton does this in the context of amino acids as well, because in a proteins lecture, his, his book is titled Proteins, by the way. Um, it's the amino acid volumes, the amino acid partial volume, partial volume in terms of um, total volume of the amino acids, okay, in cubic angstroms uh, that are also reflected in what you're being shown. Um, later on, very quickly, we're going to get into partial specific volumes, partial molar volumes, and we're going to see that these units change dramatically to cc's cubed or centimeters cubed per gram. And so there'll be a completely different way of thinking about this, but generally speaking, these are the volumes that we ascribe to the various amino acids, okay? And then when we make a protein, we then sum all of these volumes in some way that reflects the number of amino acids of each type and give you volumes of partial molar, partial specific volumes of proteins, okay? And so that has to be kind of thought of uh, as being derived from the van der Waals numbers and built up into larger and larger structures. Okay. The partial problem with that is that these volumes are rough. What I mean by that is the surface of the structures that we're talking about are not smooth. They're not actually spheres with a smooth surface. It's not really a ball, okay? They're actually rough surfaces. And the rough surfaces means that they have rough surfaces to, that go into the calculation of what the total volume is, okay? So this table reflects accessible surface area, given the total accessible surface area of each amino acid, due to the main chains and due to the side chains, and then they break it up into polar and nonpolar, you can see that there's this calculation that we have to go through that defines how solvent and other macromolecules interact with one another, okay? And so there's this accessible surface area that has to be taken into account, okay? How do they interact with one another? So accessible surface area years ago was defined as the surface that you get when you roll a ball over the surface, the ball being the size of a water molecule with, an ang with a size of 1.4 angstroms. Okay, and the issue is, is that these surfaces have irregularities in them. And let me see if I can. So you can imagine that the irregularity is such that now you roll a ball over this surface and the ball doesn't necessarily penetrate everything. Okay, it doesn't penetrate anything, but it gives you a kind of a smooth representation of what might be going on. Uh, John, in his last lecture, I think, was talking about crevices and clefts. Well, if there's a crevice and a cleft here where the substrate binds, maybe the water can't penetrate, so it's not accessible. Maybe other ligands can't penetrate without some kind of a conformational change, so it's not, quote unquote, accessible surface area. And so this ends up being part of the calculation that you have to take into account. All right. And so this is another part of the discussion that we have to have in terms of how these molecules interact with one another, how they interact with the solvent, and how we sort of think about that and include that in calculations. It comes up in a lot of what you're doing with JOM in terms of how it's visualized, but you then have to really begin to think how it affects uh, the way that enzymes and substrates and cofactors might interact. Okay.
Now, Creighton then moves on to electrostatic forces, and this is by way of introduction to other kinds of forces, okay? And it begins with Coulomb's law. And Coulomb's law, strictly speaking, is in a vacuum, <clears throat> okay? And it's the energy between two point charges where the charges are reflected in Z sub A and Z sub B. So these are the point charges. They can be positive or negative. They can be repulsive or attractive. They're multiplied times the total charge on an electron. So that's what e epsilon represents in the right units for charge on an electron, okay? divided by the distance between the center of the point charge A and B. So there are points and we're putting all of the charge in the middle of the point, and then we're separating them by some radius, okay? And as we'll see, there's a point and a point, A and B, and there's a distance, okay? The reality will be that there's a volume and a volume and a distance, and the charge is actually distributed across the entire volume. <clears throat> and so is this equation an actual representation of this physical scenario? That's part of the question that you have to sort of ask. Now, we don't talk about electrostatics in vacuums. That was the original calculation done by Coulomb years ago. We talk about it in terms of interactions in a solvent usually. And we usually think of this as a homogeneous, sorry, as a homogeneous dielectric constant. And so the equation changes because there's a dielectric to the medium and the dielectric constant decreases the total energy between the point charges. And this happens because there's water in here. And the water arranges itself in a way so it points towards different objects in different ways. And it essentially screens the charges between uh, from one another. And so it alters the energy between the charges. And so if it's a water environment, this is something that has to be taken into account. And so the dielectric constant of water is usually defined as 78 at something like 20 or 25 degrees, okay? And so this is obviously a really big diminishing of the total energy between molecules. In addition to this, there's things like sodium and chloride in here, okay? So how do they screen? How do they get in the way? And how do they affect these interactions? That's another part of the calculation that one has to take into account. We'll talk about that a little bit today and a lot more later. <clears throat> okay, now this is point charges. Okay, but generally speaking, when molecules interact with one another, represented over here uh, on the right with this figure taken out of Creighton, you have interactions that are often not single interactions. It's not just that you have this average charge interacting with this average charge and you can plug it into this equation for energy based upon this distance. In addition to this, you often also have hydrogen bonding between different parts of the molecules in, a different, in addition to electrostatic interactions. So it's often a combination of electrostatics and hydrogen bonding. This is what is often referred to as a salt bridge, okay? In addition to this, sometimes the interactions involve side chains with protonatable or deprotonatable protons. And the energetics of that deprotonation, the pKa values, are sensitive to the kind of solvent that you're in and the polarity around that molecule, okay? And so you can have some kind of an active site, 
and the active site can have some kind of a carboxyl, okay? And it might have a deprotonated charge, but there might be other charges around that carboxyl that influence the carboxyl, but also influence the way that it interacts with a substrate because the substrate doesn't just see the carboxyl from say aspartic acid, it sees the entire en environment. And so the calculations and the reality are much more complicated than what this simple sense of an interaction in, in the, in the uh, Coulomb's law reflects, okay? So things can be much more complicated. All right, uh, this last sentence refers to these two figures, uh, these two tables. These are actually tables, I say figures here, but these are actually tables. Where is it? There we go. These are actually tables, four and five. <clears throat> Simply showing you that pKa values depend upon the solvent. This is an unusual solvent involving dioxane in water. Um, and the change in the pK depending upon how the water environment changes. Okay, And you can see that some of them go down and some of them go up. And it just depends on what it is that we're really talking about. Okay. And then again, this is in the terms of the solvent, but the steric effects on the pKa's in terms of the environment around the protonatable group. Okay, so these are all carboxyls, okay, with very different pKa's because there are groups around it that make it um, nonpolar as you increase the methyl content around it. And so the pKs change dramatically because putting a charge here makes it unfavorable in terms of its ability to interact with um, the surrounding environment. This is steric influences within a molecule. If I go back here and I draw a complementary side over here, oops, and I have another yeah, come on. I have another carboxyl on this side, and this carboxyl is protonated. It might be protonated because this environment is full of hydrophobic groups, and these hydrophobic groups don't like a charge. And so the pK of this carboxyl shifts in a way that makes sure it stays protonated. The pK usually will go up here. So at any given pH, this will be protonated at that pH. This pK goes down to make sure at any given pH, it's deprotonated, okay? So this is something that I discussed in one of the slides on, I believe, enzymes uh, in medical biochemistry. Okay, but this is the same idea, and Creighton is introducing it in terms of the solvent and also in terms of steric effects. That here it's in terms of molecules, but we could be talking about this in terms of um, environments in a protein fold. Okay. Now, point charges, I've given you lots of reasons to not believe in point charges. Although electrostatic calculations make that assumption. But in fact, very often molecules and, and surfaces don't have effective charges, but they do have dipoles. Okay. And so this section of Creighton says a net charge is not required to interact electrostatically because electron density can be localized due to atoms with different electronegativity. An example of this is a peptide bond, which is shown below, that's figure 4.3, which has a partial charge of 0.4 electrons due to the polarity of the oxygen and the nitrogen. 
So you write a peptide bond down in this way with a carbonyl and an amide, and there's no effective charge. But we know that there's this double bond character. John was writing this down as pushing electrons. And when you push this double bond character so that there's a double bond character between the carbon and the nitrogen, and this becomes a planar structure that affects the uh, characteristics of the peptide, there's now a negative charge, partial negative charge on the oxygen, and there's now a partial positive charge on the proton. And so we now have a dipole, okay? We now have a dipole across the peptide bond. And this dipole can interact with other molecules, other sites in the protein, okay? Other dipole moments in a peptide bonds and other group side chains in the fold of the protein, okay? So we now have what we refer to as a dipole with a dipole moment. And the dipole moment is defined as here. The dipole moment is defined as the apparent excess charge. So approximately here, it's 0.4 times the distance. Now, the distance depends on where you put the charge localization. And we're sort of now back to point charges. Is that the distance? Okay, and so are we now putting the charge at the center of the proton? We're making the same sorts of approximations here, all right? So one electron unit of charge separated by one angstrom has a dipole moment of 4.8 to by. And you can think of this as a definition, okay? One electric unit separated, separated by one angstrom, okay? So one, one, and the units that you get are Dubai. They're named after somebody named Dubai. And we know therefore that 4.8 gives you some relative value. So the dipole moment of a peptide bond is 3.5 Dubai. Okay, so you can sort of calculate that this is going to be something like 0.4 times a distance. Okay, and you so you could calculate what that distance is by plugging these numbers in. Okay, and that distance is going to be in terms of angstroms, that distance is going to be what is that? It's going to be approximately, uh, it's approximately nine. Okay, a little less than nine angstroms, okay, from here to here, okay? A water molecule has a dipole moment of 1.8 to buy. I asked you to calculate that in the homework. And so what that means is we have electron density differences. We have electronegativity distance differences. Oxygen is more electronegative than protons. So we have an effective charge on the oxygen and effective positive charges on the proton. So now the dipole moment runs through the middle of the water molecule. How do you calculate the size of this? Because it's not between two point charges, it's between the entire molecule. And so you have to do projections, projections along this axis and along this axis and project down to the combined axis. And that's something that you'll have to figure out in the homework assignment, okay? Now, the Coulomb's law was with respect to one over R for the energy. Okay, one over R. Dipoles don't really interact that way. They have both direction. Here's the direction of this dipole. So it's like having a magnet, a negative pole and a plus pole and how magnets line up. And when magnets line up, they can have repulsive interactions or they can have attractive interactions in just this way that I just drew on the screen. 
Okay. And so you have to take all of those into account, but how do you then make this calculation? Okay. And so this is sort of a, a whole other uh, discussion involving how dipoles interact and whether they're fixed dipoles or moving dipoles and whether the dipoles are stable or transient, whether they're induced or permanent. Okay. And so dipole dipole interactions can go as one over R squared or one over R cubed or one over R to the sixth. Okay. It gets complicated. Okay. And so we'll come back to this later when we talk about other kinds of interactions uh, and other people will, I'll show you tables that people publish for dipole dipole interactions or dipole induced dipole interactions or induced dipole induced dipole interactions. Okay. These are things that we'll be talking about shortly. All right. And so I'll save that for a moment here and we'll come back to this. Okay, but here is one reflection of what this means. <clears throat> Van der Waals interactions between permanent and induced dipoles <clears throat> are usually known to obey what is known as a Leonard Jones potential. This is R to the, sixth R to the 12th, it's inverse R to the sixth R to the 12th dependency. So as you two objects, two permanent or induced dipoles get closer and closer to one another, this axis here is distance reflected here with D. So it matches the units of the dipole moment that we used above, okay? And so there are attractive interactions. So the interaction energy is negative and there are repulsive interactions. The attractive interactions obey distance to the inverse sixth power. Repulsive interactions obey distance to the minus 12th power or some higher order potential, okay? And so this induces or causes a Leonard Jones potential where it begins to be attractive and then beyond a certain point, it begins to be repulsive, okay? And so the van der Waals radius then becomes some distance that creates a repulsive or impenetrable distance. I can get to this point and I'm attracted, but I'm also now beginning to be repulsed. And so this ends up being the effective or the optimal van der Waals interaction. We could define it as this point where it crosses zero. We could define it at this point where it's at a minima, okay? It's generally defined as the point that's the minima, okay? And so this energy is determined at the minimum of the calculation in this R to the minus sixth, R to the minus 12th function, okay? And so there's a discussion of this here and in the text. So the problem set I give you is using a Leonard Jones potential, calculate the van der Waals contact distances for these examples, okay? And so these examples give the coefficient for the R to the sixth and the coefficient for the R to the 12th term. Notice the coefficient for A is negative. The coefficient for B is positive. These are attractive, these are repulsive. The CC values are these, the CO values, the CN values, the OO values, et cetera. And so how do you do this? You take first derivatives and set it equal to zero, okay? And so that's the calculation. Now, uh, last week I tried to do this in a very sloppy way uh, on a PowerPoint where I wrote this all out. This is what I was actually copying. It's a function that when plotted would look like this. There are two minima and one maxima at values of minus one, one, and two. If you take the derivative of this equation or rearrange this equation and take the derivative, this is the equation that you get. You can fractionate it out in this way and you can see that there are minima and maxima at plus and minus one and at plus two. 
And then determining whether these are minima or maxima involves the second derivative. And so I went through this quickly last week, and hopefully this was a review of some calculus that you've had and knowing what minima and maxima are. What's happening here is you're gonna to have to take first derivatives of this equation with these coefficients and then solve for the R. And that will be the van der Waals contact distance, okay? All right, and so I won't go through all of this again. This is what you have to do. So then Creighton goes on to hydrogen bonds. And the hydrogen bonds, he goes on to discussing distance and angles, okay? And the distance, I'm uh, sorry, the distance and angles, okay, are generally uh, different in every particular situation. There are all kinds of steric factors uh, in large macromolecules that influence the distance and the angle that exists between the proton and whatever it's making a hydrogen bond to, okay? So here, the angle involves the, the distance or the between the NH group and the oxygen that it's making a hydrogen bond to. Typically, we make hydrogen bonds between nitrogen H's and oxygen H's. And the acceptor is usually a carbonyl or some kind of an oxygen group or some kind of a nitrogen group along a chain. And in general, those angles are approximately 180 degrees, but you can see not exactly. There's a distribution in any given set of structures that you look at. And the amount of energy that's involved, therefore, will depend upon both the distance and the angle. Okay. Um, the section in Creighton sort of discusses this in lots of different ways. It tries to discuss this in terms of different kind of angle combinations. For example, between a carbonyl and an amide and what those different angles might be between different sorts of orientations and where they tend to be centered, okay? And where you tend to see the, the optimal values. Um, we talk about this, we talk about this in terms of, yeah, we talk about this in terms of maximizing energy, okay? The energy that is talked about is often something as large as two to 10 kcals, Okay, uh, and it depends on distance and angle. All right, and so that's something that we'll come up with later, but it, it, I usually talk about this in medical biochemistry, and I describe this as how many hydrogen bonds lead to effective binding and how much total energy does that contribute. And we'll come back to this when we talk about macromolecular interactions shortly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so then Creighton gets into something called the properties of liquid water and the characteristics of non-covalent interactions. And so now we're beginning to say, okay, here's is a list of, in some details about the kind of covalent interactions we're talking about. We're talking about electrostatic, we're talking about hydrogen bonding, we're talking about van der Waals contacts, we're talking about point charges and dipoles, but how does being in water change that and affect that? Okay, and so you have to begin with water. I've already sort of talked to you about this, but this is another way of thinking about it. Uh, one of the most important things about water is, is that there's this unusual radial distribution function that reflects how water surrounds itself. Okay, and so water tends to be surrounding other water molecules in some sort of volume. In ice, it's all held in place through hydrogen bonding. At different temperatures, uh, there's a change in the number of water molecules that are present, <clears throat> but it tends to give rise to a peak, a peak at approximately three angstroms distance. And then at the second layer, we have more water molecules that tend to be oriented, and they tend to be at some kind of a twice the distance, which reflects something about the volume of a water molecule. So this is the volume of one water molecule. This is the volume of two water molecules. This is the volume of three water molecules. And this reflects how 
oriented they are in those particular volumes. And you can see it falls off pretty dramatically. It's mostly one water molecule deep, okay? Um, that's discussed in a lot of this literature here, okay? <clears throat> All right, he then goes on to talk about solubility and interactions. So solubility in this case means solubility in water. All right, and we're gonna begin with the solubility of amino acids. <clears throat> and so we're going to talk about the range over which amino acids are soluble in water at some pH value. And so this is taken out of um, Creighton, and it shows you that molecules like leucine, isoleucine, valine, alanine have a fairly low solubility. If this is the solubility between, so this is a, <clears throat> excuse me, this is reflected down here by KD, is the concentration in water versus the concentration in some kind of a vapor phase. Okay, so it's, um, it's a relative solubility between water and vapor. So can you actually vaporize the amino acid? And <clears throat> you can see that molecules like leucine, isoleucine, uh, alanine are being very nonpolar, very hydrophobic, don't actually like to be in water. And so they have low solubility or low concentration in water. And then as you go down the chart and you get into things that have more polarity, more hydrophilicity, then you can see that the solubility increases dramatically. And that's reflected here in terms of this scale, which has leucine, isoleucine, valine, here's leucine, isoleucine, valine at the bottom of the scale, very small numbers. Glycine is always defined as zero because all of these are normalized scales. <clears throat> and then these other molecules that have higher polarity tend to have much higher hydrophilicity. And then this is the actual opposite of the hydrophobicity scale, where these molecules have, generally speaking, high hydrophobicity versus low hydrophobicity. And it, it tries to reflect something about the amino acid and modified amino acids that sort of account for charges. We generally try to do this in a way so that the charge isn't contributing to it. And that becomes a separate calculation, aspartic acid with and without a charge. And very often they use um, molecules that look like leucine, isoleucine, but are not leucine, isoleucine. So they take into account what the R group itself might be contributing to the solubility or to the hydrophobicity or to the hydrophilicity, which is the inverse scale, okay? And so you can see that hydrophobicity is generally normalized around glycine, and it tries to create a scale that reflects water repelling or water liking, okay? So these molecules generally don't like water because they tend to have hydrophobic surfaces, hydrophobic R groups. These molecules tend to like water, Okay, so they tend to reflect the inverse of hydrophobicity, the attractiveness to water, the attractiveness to the surface of a protein, for example. These molecules would like to be in the interior of a protein. These would like to be on the surface. These would like to be in water. Excuse me. These calculated values would like to be in water, and these values would like to be not in water, buried in some way away from the water, okay? And so that's basically what this is sort of reflecting. This table is trying to break this down in terms of side chains, in terms of what the entire amino acid might be reflective of, in terms of N-acetyl amides, meaning they're getting rid of charges, 
when they do this. And that's what these modifications over here reflect. And so all of these scales are sort of trying to re reflect liking or not liking water, liking the interior of a protein, liking the surface of a protein, okay? And so part of what we're doing here is we're asking, are these useful in terms of understanding protein folding and protein structure and how macromolecules interact with one another? Okay, these are, the, these are sort of the beginnings of that type of a calculation, that, that, that type of a, con, uh, a conversation. Okay. <clears throat> the interaction component of this and so here's the interaction component that he introduces is reflected in these two slides okay so this table shows you the kinds of interactions that occur between small molecules and their interaction with proteins but these interactions could in fact be interactions between proteins summed over many interactions. And what they're trying to do is assign values to what these interactions might be, so that if you have a whole series of these interactions between the, between the surface of one protein and the surface of another protein, when these interactions occur and you try to sum them over all of the interactions, what values do you use for the sums? And how do you get the total interaction that might be occurring? And so salt bridges would be one way of doing this. You have charged groups that interact with one another. This is in fact a charge hydrogen bond type of interaction, okay? But you have this interaction between arginine side chain and uh, some kind of a carboxyl, okay? You have some interaction between a, uh, a side of a, a, the alpha amino and a phenylalanine, for example. How do you calculate these and how do you think about these in terms of um, total interactions between small molecules or between proteins? Notice the discussion very often is <clears throat> that these salt bridges don't necessarily have to be on the surface. These could be buried because you're neutralizing the charges, okay? And so they could survive in the interior of a protein potentially or partially buried in a protein. Various hydrogen bonds are listed here with their potential energies. These are association constants, but these can be turned into energies based upon what that association constant is. Uh, we'll come back to talking about that in a little bit. And then van der Waals contacts. Now appreciate the conversation that I quickly just went over in terms of the energy of a hydrogen bond and the energy of van der Waals contacts and the energies of point charges versus dipoles are reflected in this kind of interaction, okay? <clears throat> And so these are the things that you have to sort of take into account when you want to sum over a whole lot of processes. Um, very soon, next week to begin with, we're going to start converting these energies, these equilibrium constants into free energies. So we're going to start talking about this in terms of Gibbs free energy, enthalpies, and entropies. Okay, so we're going to be talking about this in terms of this type of a calculation. All right. That's a minus T. And so down below is temperature, <clears throat> degree Kelvin. Okay, this says centigrade, but when you do this calculation, you actually have to use degree Kelvin. Okay. Uh, and you know already that minus R, T, L, N, K is where you get this conversion from affinity to free energy, okay? And so what this plot is doing is showing you that you can have huge changes in enthalpy and huge changes in entropy, but the sum is a modest change in free energy. 
Okay, and so this is a typical plot. This is reflected in kilojoules, not kilocalories. But none the oh, kilocalories is over here. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, but this general plot is something that we'll see and see often as we go through this. This could reflect any interaction, macromolecular, small ligand, et cetera, and how you convert to an enthalpic term and how do you convert to an entropic term and what that means. This is what a big part of this course is really about. Okay. The one example that he goes through in a lot of detail is the hydrophobic effect. And he starts putting this in terms of various pathways, for example, so I'm looking at this now and I have to go back and look at the, the legend to this to make sure I'm gonna say this correctly. Here we go. Typical thermodynamics of transfer of a nonpolar molecule, the size of cyclohexane between the gas, the liquid, and the solid phase. And uh, aqueous solutions at two temperatures. A at 20 degrees and B at 140 degrees, okay. So this plot is the transfer of cyclohexane going from a gas phase to a liquid phase to a solid phase. And then imagining what this might look like. So here is represented Okay, if I understand what I'm looking at now, this is what a cyclohexane looks like. And the conversion to a liquid, so this is actually the liquid phase for the cyclohexane, and this is the transfer into an aqueous solution, and this is the transfer of the cyclohexane into a solid phase. So this is what's going on with the cyclohexane. And this is what's going on when you go into aqueous solutions. And what we're doing is we're converting these transitions or these transfers <clears throat> to the transfer free energy. Okay. And so this one is done at 20 degrees and 20 degrees is chosen because the enthalpy at 20 degrees is zero. And this one is done at 140 degrees because the entropy at 140 degrees is zero. And so they're trying, and we'll come back to this because we're going to read some stuff that specifically talks about why this is and how you use these values to interpret stuff, okay? So this is jumping way ahead of ourselves, but it kind of puts this into a context. Delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. The change in free energy is equal to a change in enthalpy minus a change in entropy, okay? And so thermodynamics always involve changing from state two from state one. It always involves a transition from one state to another. And we reflect this as deltas. We don't ever generally put down what the free energy absolute value is of state two and the free energy absolute value of, of state one and free energy of absolute value of state two. Those are things that we generally don't know, <clears throat> but we can calculate differences, okay? And so putting a cyclohexane from a gas to a liquid involves a negative enthalpy, a negative entropy, and a negative free energy. 
And so this is generally speaking a favorable reaction, okay? All right, the negative enthalpy comes from the fact that the cyclohexanes like one another. The negative entropy reflects the fact that you are immobilizing them a little bit and they don't like being immobilized, okay? If you then make this a solid phase where you lose the dynamics of the liquid, it's still got a favorable enthalpy. It's still got an unfavorable enthalpy, uh, entropy, excuse me. But now the overall free energy is now unfavorable. The entropy now is the dominant term and it makes a solid phase for cyclohexane unfavorable. Okay. If you then go from the liquid phase or the solid phase into water, where the cyclohexane now is in a water solution. To go to a water solution, you have to create a cavity big enough for the cyclohexane. And then the water molecules around it organize themselves in a way to reflect the fact that they don't like the cyclohexane, okay? At 20 degrees from water, this has no enthalpic contribution, but it does have an unfavorable entropic contribution because the water around the cyclohexane is organized and it doesn't like that. So this is an unfavorable transition. Going from the solid to aqueous solution is also unfavorable with slightly different numbers. There is no enthalpic value. It's unfavorable, actually. I think that looks like a minus. Sorry, I'm looking down. That is a plus. Yes, that's a plus. That's a plus. Yeah, that's a plus two, a minus three. So unfavorable, unfavorable, unfavorable delta G. Okay. But this is temperature dependent. When you go to a higher temperature, these values change. These values change, for example, because the cyclohexane in water, okay, <clears throat> doesn't allow the water to orient itself <clears throat> because it's so dynamic due to the high temperature that the entropy change is zero. So there's an unfavorable enthalpy term, okay? But a zero contribution to the entropy. And so the free energy of this transition is again, unfavorable. Notice the unfavorability is similar, <coughs> but it's an enthalpic effect instead of an entropic effect, okay? So it changes from an enthalpic to entropic effect. All right, and then you can go around the cycle in a similar way talking about this. Now, there's a term here that I haven't described. This has to do with the heat capacity. And the heat capacity has to do with the change in free energy with temperature, okay? And it has to do with the fact that the enthalpy changes with temperature. And this is where you get heat capacity. So let me go back here. <clears throat> this equation that uh, you may remember from medical biochemistry and may remember from your other courses is the standard state value. And it can be derived from the equilibrium constant corrected for the RT term, okay? If you plot natural logarithm of the equilibrium constant versus one over the temperature, generally the values that you get will be straight lines. <clears throat> they might be this way, they might be the other way. If you have minus R, T, L, N, K, is equal to delta G naught, but we can reflect this as essentially delta H minus T delta S, 
Okay. Then ln k can be written as minus delta h over rt plus delta s over r. So all I've done is I've taken the rt minus rt and divided both sides. <clears throat> so this is minus delta h over r times one over t plus delta s over r. So this slope, this slope gives you the enthalpy corrected for the r term. So the slope minus the slope gives you the enthalpy. The intercept will give you delta S over R, okay? So this slope is minus delta H over R. This slope is negative. It's a minus a minus. So this ends up being a positive enthalpy. This slope is a positive minus that is a negative enthalpy. So repulsive attractive, okay? If there's a change, if there's a change in the enthalpy with temperature, then that's a measure of what is known as the heat capacity. In other words, if this plot actually has curvature to it, so that everywhere along it, it has a different slope, then that reflects a heat capacity change. It reflects the fact that the enthalpy interaction is different at different temperatures. Now we'll talk about this a lot, but that's reflected right here. At 20 degrees, the enthalpy is zero for cyclohexane going into water. At 140 degrees, the enthalpy is plus seven. So there's a change in the enthalpy. Notice there's also a change in the entropy. And so the heat capacity also reflects the change in the ent enthalpy, okay? But that is what that means. And it's reflected in the fact that this simple plot would be curved, not linear, okay? And so we'll talk about this a lot in the next sections, okay? I'm going to keep the annotations so that will be what I post. Um, online when we're done. Okay, so let's stop for a second. And let's talk if there's anything to talk about. <clears throat> so do you have any questions about what I just went over? What we're going to do next is the paper by Kite and Doolittle. But do you have any questions or comments about what I just went over? Just unmute yourself and speak. So apparently I'm being brilliant today, huh? Okay, <clears throat> there will be um, lectures in the future where uh, I specifically force your hand, sort of the way John has been asking you to do certain things with assignments he's giving you. And I'm going to do similar sorts of things uh, as we move forward, okay? To bring you out from your shell, but also to speak out loud. Uh, there's, there's a famous quote, how do I know what I think until I say it or until I hear myself say it, okay? Ideas to verbalization are not necessarily easy things. And so you have to sort of get a sense of thinking about stuff. How would I say that? How would I write it down? How would I investigate that? Okay. So now I'm going to go back and this I'm going to just bury for the moment. And I'm going to go back to sharing and let's see what I have open here. There it is. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen.
So this is a paper by Kite and Doolittle, um, published a while ago, 1982, um, that basically uh, discusses the hydrophobic or hydropathic character of proteins, and it asks, what can you do with it? Okay, so if I make this bigger, that may or may not help. I'm not sure. Oh, you guys disappear. Oh, you're down here, aren't you? There you are. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so in the introduction, in Creighton's section, there's a lot of use of the term hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity. And now, there and now, we're talking about the dependence on amino acid composition, the amino acid sequence. Okay. So, do you like water? Do you not like water? Do you like protein interiors? Hydrophobic, do you not like hydrophobic uh, protein interiors? Okay. <clears throat> and so this gives rise to what is referred to as hydrophobic scales. And that was already introduced in Creighton in many different ways. And it was trying to break it down into <clears throat> backbones and side chains charged and uncharged and how you take into account all of that. And so the question is, is can we come up with a hydrophobic scale for all 20 natural amino acids? Okay. And then what can you do with it? Okay. So this is a remarkably ambitious paper. Um, <clears throat> it's trying to do everything with this scale. The scales that it uses are stolen from other people and then sort of rationalized to be different slightly, and then applied to different kinds of amino acid sequences with the number of questions being answered, okay? So part of the question that they're answering is can you predict which amino acids are on the surface and which amino acids are buried? Okay, and so I'm not sure this is the way to start doing this, but I'm going to do this. Okay, so surface or buried. And part of the issue is, is that this is essentially asking at low resolution, <clears throat> can you tell me what the fold is? Here's the linear sequence. Where does it look like? What does it look like in the protein folded? Who's on the interior? Who's on the exterior? Can you predict that just from the sequence, just from the hypophobic scale? Okay. And so they're going to set up a scale and then scan along that scale in some way and ask this region here, is this surface or buried? This region here, surface or buried, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The second thing that they sort of get into has to do with membrane interactions. Or one of the things they get into, I think that's done in sort of two consecutive steps. And what they're really getting into is membrane spanning segments. Okay, can you find the regions of a protein that will span a membrane where the membrane is hydrophobic, it has a low dielectric constant, and you want the protein segment to go across the membrane. And I've drawn it as a helix. It may not be a helix. <clears throat> it may be a beta sheet. It may be a random coil. Okay, that's the question. Can I predict the sections that are membrane spanning regions? Okay. <clears throat> Those are the two main questions that this paper is sort of trying to ask. 
And it's asking uh, in some bit detail after that how other things might be qualified. In other words, this seems to work, but it would be better if I make other changes. What are those other changes? Why might those other changes be more reasonable than the scale that I've come up with? <clears throat> okay. This is a typical molecular biology paper, Journal of Molecular Biology from the early 80s. Uh, it's long, it has a lot of discussion, they get a lot of leeway. You know, it's 27 pages long and there's a lot of opportunity to double guess, to, to kind of wonder if you're making any sort of sense. So it gives an introduction to the logic of this. It tells you about other scales that people have come out with. It tells you about what kind of predictions it's going to try to be making. Can you actually predict secondary structures, not just folds, but maybe just secondary structures, et cetera, and then goes on to make these applications. So the computer program is a big part of this. <clears throat> uh, they call it SOAP for some reason, and it's a sum over so many amino acids in the sequence. And so when you do a case of a SOAP7, the first value that you get is the sum of the hydropathies from residue one to seven, <clears throat> excuse me. And then you get hydropathy from two to eight, and three to nine, four to 10, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And those values get plotted, but they end up being the average of seven residues or nine residues or 11 residues or 13 residues. And the question is partially, how many should you average and what should you trust? So in this figure that I drew back here, way up here, the distance across this membrane is generally speaking 20 amino acids, depending on the secondary structure. And so do you need to be using 20 to be able to make this prediction? Can you use shorter ones and it still sort of gives you the right length? And, and does the 20s become sort of some magical thing and that allows you to make this sort of assignment because you know it's approximately 20 residues long? Okay, so that's part of the question. Alpha helices, for example, are very seldom that long in protein folds. So do you use shorter numbers because it allows you to do a better job of predicting certain kinds of secondary structures and how they're buried or on the surface, et cetera. So th those are kinds of questions that you have to think about and worry about. Uh, this is 1980 something. You'll notice here Two extensive amino acid libraries, so sequence libraries, was purchased from the National Biomedical Research Foundation. Okay, um, you no longer have to purchase stuff. It's made freely available in all the databases that you know about or are being made to know about. Okay, but in 1983, there weren't that many of them and people were trying to make money from it. Okay. And then there's a long introduction to where the hydropathy values come from, okay? They give a funny introduction here that I hadn't seen in a long time, hydropathy, strong feelings about water, okay? Like or unlike, okay? Hydrophobic, hydrophilic. I like water, I don't like water, okay? This all tends to be based upon water, all right? And they describe a number of different existing scales. One of the original scales was from Nozaki and Tanford. Okay, and then there are many others that they talk about. These scales are based upon transfer free energy. Okay, they're based upon transfer free energy, similar to the figure that I just showed you having to do with cyclohexane moving uh, into a liquid or a solid and into an aqueous solution. All right, so the transfer in this case is usually between water and some alcohol. Uh, here they're talking a lot about ethanol. Subsequent scales talk about things like octanol, 
And there's a whole series of questions about what you should and should not be using here. The idea is, is that octanol or ethanol are similar to the interior of a protein. So this has a dielectric constant of 78. These have dielectric constants of approximately two. The interior of a protein, uh, doesn't want me to skip pages, has a dielectric constant of what? One of the things about dielectric constants is that they are generally referring to homogeneous environments. Interiors of proteins are not homogeneous. Every section of the interior is slightly different because there's different amino acids with different interactions going on. So what's the right environment to mimic this? That's partially the question. Some of the scales that exist have to do with the interior of membranes, okay? Alpha helices, for example, going through a membrane. What's the dielectric of a membrane? Many of these scales focus on proteins, okay? But is the interior of a membrane too? Is this the right environment for a membrane? Are membranes homogeneous? John has talked to you about this a lot. Membranes are generally not homogeneous. They're much more complicated than that. And then when you have multiple chains that cross in a bundle, what does that do? How does that change the calculation? Okay. When you have proteins that interact with the surface of a membrane, what do you use and how do you make these calculations? That becomes another part of this problem. Okay. So there's a long discussion of different scales that people use and what they accept and what they reject, <clears throat> okay? And so they tend to reject a lot of the assumptions that other workers make, and they give you sort of an obvious um, preference or explanation for why they choose the scales that they choose, okay? Um, This is 1982. I think another, another paper I was just thinking about, it was subsequent to this. <clears throat> they also talk about this as though we're not just talking about surface and buried. We're talking about mostly buried, completely buried, partially buried. <clears throat> if something is on the surface, can it be partially buried and interacts with the solvent, but not completely accessible to the solvent? And how does that change the calculation? And so this is part of the whole complexity here, that we're trying to make a scale that is based upon hydrophilic, hydrophobic environments, where the environments are not absolutely one or the other, they're partial. And so it makes it a, a much more subtle sort of discussion that they get into. The transfer of free energies that are used, I just described it to you as ethanol and octanol, but a lot of the original transfer of free energies were in terms of water and vapor. In other words, if you actually convert the amino acid to a vapor phase, and you actually ask the question what the transfer of free energy is between the water aqueous phase and the vapor phase, is that a reasonable scale? The the cycle in that figure a little while ago, going from the gas phase to the liquid phase, to the solid phase, to the aqueous phase, is partially a reflection of this, okay? It's a vapor phase to interior, exterior of interiors of proteins uh, that they're sort of comparing. And they're trying to come up with values that makes sense in all of these contexts. Other papers that we'll be talking about um, do this in very different ways and they have very different models because they're trying to come up with very different sorts of applications. So here is an introduction to, this is one of two representations of the scale they came up with, okay? So here are the amino acids. Here are the volumes of the amino acids in cc's per mole. 
Okay. And here is condensed vapor scales, the, free, the transfer free energy, water into ethanol scale, and ethanol into some kind of a condensed vapor. So they're talking about these transfers between one another, and then trying to look at this and say, does this predict some kind of a scale? <clears throat> okay, so why volume? Why is that in the table? I used the term a little while ago, cavity. When you move cyclohexane into water, it creates a cavity. It displaces the water. So if you move an amino acid into the interior of a protein or into an ethanol phase or into the interior of a membrane, it displaces something. What does it displace? How much does it displace? And then how much surface area is there that it now interacts with? And so the energy that it takes to do that is going to reflect how big the cavity is and how much surface area there is, and therefore how much surface interaction there has to be <clears throat> to be able to do this. So it has to be a critical part of the calculation. Okay. Now, here down below and throughout the paper, they talk about charge. All right. And I'm not going to go through all of the aspects of this. But part of the question is, is when you bury something, <clears throat> for example, an amino acid, there are necessarily charges. But when you bury side chains along a peptide, these amide and carboxyl charges are gone, except for the C-terminus and N-terminus charges. <clears throat> but part of the question is, what do you do with the charge? And how do you account for the charge? because creating a cavity with a charge and creating a cavity without a charge is different. And so often these tables spend a lot of time and a lot of uh, effort talking about getting rid of the charge effects. What happens if we do aspartic acid without, with protonation of the side chain and then without protonation of the side chain? So in other words, the tables very often are pH dependent. That's why in the table in Creighton, there are analogs for the side chains. And the analogs are meant to get rid of the contribution of the backbone and just talk about the contribution of the side chains without the charge contributions, okay? And so they'll use those as mimics or analogs of side chains and create tables based upon those analogs, okay? This is then converted to some kind of an index, okay? So those are transfer, tree, transfer free energies, but the scale that they actually want to use has to do with some kind of a normalized scale so that it becomes standard in the field. <clears throat> and they arbitrarily come up with plus and minus 4.5 as the scale. It could be plus and minus one. It could be plus and minus 100. This is the scale that they choose, okay? And then they transfer this to imagining a scale that reflects the water vapor. And then they transfer this to a scale that imagines 100% burial versus 95% burial. In other words, the cost is going to be different because you didn't completely bury it. And so they're trying to imagine all the scenarios that they might have to take into account. They make a big deal out of the fact that you should not treat these scales as absolute numbers. And that a lot of times they're approximate and a lot of times you can, you can approximate them by just giving them average value. So notice glutamic acid, glutamine, aspartic acid, asparagine, all have the value of 3.5, negative 3.5. They're trying to not make a big deal out of the differences. To give something that is approximately right, <clears throat> but doesn't try to cut it too fine, all right? And so this is the scale that they're using. And so what they're gonna do is they're gonna run across a sequence <clears throat> and that they're gonna sum these hydropathy values and then assign it to the middle value. That's why they use seven, nine, 11, et cetera, okay? And then they're going to say, ha, huh, what do I get as a sum of the hydropathy values? 
And what do I see? What does it tell me or teach me? Okay. So the first example they use, the first example they use is chymotrypsinogen. Okay. And so here's chymotrypsinogen with five residues, nine residues, 13 residues. All right. And then this is across the sequence. The sequence is approximately 240 amino acids. So when you average five residues, you start out in the positive scale, and then it's around zero, noisy, and then it goes back to the positive scale and the negative scale, and it's up and down, up and down, up and down. The noisiness has to do with the fact that you're only using the average of five numbers and assigning it to the middle value. When you go to nine, it becomes slightly smoother. When you go to 13, it becomes a lot smoother. So part of the question is, is getting rid of the noise means bigger averages. But when you go to bigger averages, it smooths something out and it might lose information or details because average over 13 amino acids may be too much and you're losing or missing features. Superimposed on this, our information is information from the crystal structure, okay? So information about buried and surface, all right? These are the regions that are buried. These are the regions that are surface groups. Does the plot called a hydrophobic index, does the plot match buried and surface? Okay, yes or no? Do I have that backwards? So buried is positive, isoleucine, valine, et cetera. Surface is the charged polar residues, okay? And what you can see is, is that it's not terrible, all right? These are buried and they're mostly positive regions. Uh, this may be something dangling off the end. That little one right there may be just on the interface. Uh, but generally speaking, the buried regions match the hydropathy index. The surface regions sort of match the hydropathy index with some resolution. You can see that this begins to sort of smear out a little bit, although it basically matches when you go to 13. So this is treated as success. This works, okay? That's their interpretation of this. They then go on to a second protein, and this protein is lactate dehydrogenase from dogfish. Um, a lot of science in the, in the early days came from fish because a lot of the isolation came from those types of sources. Um, there's a lot of data on pigs, bovine, uh, and cows, and there's a lot of data on fish in the early data, whales, for example. So here's the same sort of plot, LDH5, 9, and 13. Here's again the assignments from the crystal structure, okay? And you can see again that buried, these are all buried, and notice these are mostly zeros, buried and surface features. Some of these are really nice. Some of them are not convincing. That's nice, but is that real? See, it goes away down here with 13. It doesn't even exist at five. And then some features seem to be permanent and that looks like it's a surface feature. This looks like it's a surface feature. This looks like a surface feature that everybody seems to agree with. And so you can see I'm using the term low resolution, okay? So I have a sequence. We're skipping secondary structures at the moment. But can I go to the full topology where these will all be buried features, these will all be surface features, and I can begin to imagine how I'm going to fold up the protein to force some stuff in the middle and some stuff on the outside. And necessarily, they'll be connected to one another that prevent some regions from following to the surface or following to the interior. Okay, They'll be constrained by the attachment. But this is a general feature that they're saying, this sort of works, okay? We like this, 
Now, there's then a discussion uh, in the paper, and you should look at that very closely. There's a discussion of, is this scale really doing a good job? We spent a lot of effort trying to convince you that we've made the right scale, but what if we start tweaking the scale? What if we start just making stuff up, throwing stuff away, changing, oh, this number seems to be too big. This number seems to have too much influence. This number doesn't have enough influence, okay? And so they repeat the calculations where they've modified the scale. They've modified the scale and then they've repeated the same sort of um, calculation and they're, they're only focused on the middle one, the nine one. But what they're doing is they're trying to change the scale. Where they've kind of modified the scales and they're using average values for hydrophobic, neutral and hydrophilic, or they've modified the scale where they've adjusted what they call controversial assignments, including histidine, tryptophan, tyrosine, proline. And when they modify the scales, does it change the shapes? Do all of these peaks and valleys end up in the same place? And does it become lower or higher resolution? Does it look a little bit better, yes or no, okay? And so they're beginning to doubt themselves and they're beginning to say, gee, these scales don't really seem to be well determined. We seem to have a lot of leeway. We can be crude and just say hydrophilic, hydrophobic, neutral, or we can throw away a lot of the values for some of the amino acids like tryptophan and proline, where we don't really know if the value is right. We suspect the value is actually wrong for all kinds of reasons. And does it change the outcome? And what they're sort of telling you, and you should read the text to get you a cleaner picture of this, is it sort of doesn't matter at this resolution. These are all low resolutions and they do okay, <clears throat> but they're not great, okay? And so this is the beginning of a program for predicting folds, low resolution interior surface. In 1983, we weren't very good at predicting anything about proteins, okay? This has a long, amazing history. Um, the thing that really began all of this was simply predicting alpha helices and beta sheets and turns. There's a whole series of papers, some of which are in the list that I've given you. Uh, if we can predict who's an alpha helix and who's a sheet, then we can stick those together into a fold. That's a whole different detailed approach. That's what we do today in lots of different prediction programs, okay? This is sort of a cruder um, 10,000 foot approach to what you might be doing, okay? Here's the same sort of uh, average values, correcting some values for the LDH data. Uh, this one doesn't match up above as perfectly. Uh, it gives similar kinds of features. One of the other aspects of this that I'll point out that is not discussed in this paper are these monomers. Are these monomers or polymers? And if you have polymers, doesn't that change the surface? Because it's no longer interacting with water. It's interacting with protein surfaces from other chains. LDH is actually a polymer. <clears throat> and so that's sort of ignored here. And that's why the resolution and the, the, the emphasis is a little bit different. They then get into talking about membrane bound proteins. And then they then get into talking about membrane spanning regions. Okay. And so this is glycophorin. Glycophorin is a membrane spanning protein. It turns out to have one membrane spanning region. Here's glycophorin 7, 5R, and 7, just with some other kind of a residue change. But the question is, can you see the one transmembrane helix with this method? Can you see where that trans transmembrane helix is? Can you predict the buried sequence, which happens to be around here? Okay. And depending upon how you do it, can you 
define a membrane spanning region. So the text here says in the middle panel, cytochrome B5 is predicted, predicted. And in the lower, they're, they're making some small modifications, which I think I don't really want to get into. I think I just want to show you the feature that depending on how they sort of tweak this, they can see the single membrane spanning region, although they get a slightly different answer depending on what it modifications they make. Okay. <clears throat> and then they get into a much bigger protein. This is bacterial rhodopsin. It has seven transmembrane helices. Can you find them? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that it? Is that right? Does that make sense? Are they the right size, the right length? Is it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? What is it? What kind of a job is it doing? They use it to sort of imply that, yes, we know what they are. We know where they are from the crystal structure at this point. And the program does a pretty good job of finding them along the sequence. These are the sequences. These are the hydropathy index values. This does a pretty good job. What I would say to you is, is that chitin doolittle, the chitin doolittle method, is best at transmembranes. This is what it actually is used for today. Nobody uses chitin doolittle anymore to try to predict surface proteins and berry proteins. That was a 1982 attempt a 1982 picture of the world. This is what it's really best at, and this is what people use it for. Okay. Uh, the rest of the paper sort of takes average values and it asks questions about who's a surface residue, who's a buried residue, how well can you do with different kinds of hydrophobicities and hydrophilicities, and can you predict stuff about globular proteins Dimensions of bravular proteins is one of the things they get into here. It doesn't work. <clears throat> Reflected in a table down below, average hydrophobicities. Can you say something about the globular character, the fold in a globular sense? It doesn't work because down here they show you that all proteins sort of look the same that are globular, and all proteins that are that look the same in this new. Uh, representation that are membrane spanning, but it doesn't really allow you to separate or distinguish them from one another absolutely. And so they were trying to use this and project that this was going to be useful in a much bigger global sense. Let me switch to one other thing real quick here. No. <clears throat> uh, I'll put this out there for you. You may actually have already have access to this. This is something that you can find in lots of bioinformatics programs. Is that here? Yeah. This is the address. And in this screen, uh, it's called XPASI protein scales, there's a place where you can either grab um, an accession number or you can enter a sequence. I've actually entered the sequence of coil in here. And then you can choose scales. <clears throat> Here's Kite and Doolittle. And then you can choose a window size. It's choosing nine. That's kind of the default in Kite and Doolittle. And then I submit it. And it shows you the sequence. It shows you the quite and do little values, the hydropathy scale. And then it shows you the plot. And here's in this rendition what the quite and do little scale looks like for coilin, which is Michael A. Bear's protein. Okay. Who's hydrophobic? Who's hydrophilic? In this case, we're actually interested in bigger questions. This part of the protein is folded. This part of the protein is folded. This part of the protein is intrinsically disordered. 
We haven't even used that term yet here. <clears throat> Some of this protein is used for phase change. What part of the change is that? <clears throat> but here's the scale that you get using Kite and Doolittle. If I go back, and instead of Kite and Doolittle, <clears throat> let me warn you that there are not a few hydrophobic scales. There are literally hundreds of hydrophobic scales. Some of them are represented here. One of them is this one by Eisenberg that has a really nice discussion of the models and why their models are better than other models, why their scales are better than other scales. If you use their scale here, it sort of looks exactly the same. <clears throat> but it's a different scale with a different purpose. This is folded, this is folded, this is intrinsically disordered. Some of this region in here actually is interior. So that peak right there and that peak right there may have something to do with making condensates or making what are called membraneless organelles. In this case, it's making a cahal body. You're familiar with that from talking with Michael. Okay. What else do you want to look at? And there's all kinds of things. You can actually look at the ability to make beta sheets. There's a paper by this guy, Levitt, that's actually in the reading list that I've given you. It predicts beta sheets. Okay, so let's ask, are there any beta sheets in this structure? And can you see where are there beta sheets in the structure? I haven't defined what the scales are, but the answer is above the higher values might be, might have beta sheets. The lower values, no tendency to have beta sheets. It really depends on what the question is, but these scales allow you to do all kinds of stuff based upon all kinds of um, efforts. Here's alpha helix. Are there alpha helices here and here and no alpha helices down here? And <clears throat> that's basically right. There are some alpha helices up here there are no alpha helices in the middle. That's basically true for this particular sequence. Okay, what's your protein? What's the purpose? What are you trying to do with it? The whole list of options is here. So this introduction to hydrophobicity is actually an introduction into a whole world of computational, sometimes based upon transfer free energies, opportunities that you have for making all kinds of predictions. Things about polarity, the relative amino acid composition, I'm not sure what that gives you. That probably literally just gives you amino acid composition. It must give you a percentage. I'm not sure of the scale here. So it's plotting amino acid composition in an interesting way. Usually that's more useful as a table, but it's showing you what the composition is across the sequence. Interesting. And so you would sort of have to be able to translate the numbers into what that means in terms of composition. Okay, so that's not easily useful from this perspective. Okay, so let me stop sharing at the moment. All right, so we're running out of time real quick here. <clears throat> so, um, What I've done today is go over some problems that you are assigned. If you're one of those people who wants to turn in a repeat of a question or questions, please do so. Uh, basically, it was uh, expansion on the topics, mostly having to do with pH um, and how to solve com more complex pH problems. Then we sort of went through Creighton and discussed basic weak forces. John has been discussing this with you. Hopefully my discussion went into a little more depth where it gives you a quantitative character about what we mean. What do point charges interactions mean? Okay, electrostatics, translating that to dipoles and how dipoles are different than point charges. Okay, how permanent dipoles and induced dipoles are different from salt bridges, et cetera how salt bridges have hydrogen bonding and electrostatic interactions, and how van der Waals contacts can be used in some interesting ways to predict how these interactions are occurring. If you have an entire protein structure represented by my hands here, there are thousands of potential interactions <clears throat> of all types going on simultaneously. How do you take all of those into account? 
And then how do you translate that into a fold, <clears throat> into a conformational change, into substrate binding, into regulatory interactions, et cetera, et cetera. All the complicated software that we have access to is attempting to do that and translate these simple equations for electrostatics and for dipoles into what these interactions look like, okay? And so hopefully that was helpful. <clears throat> the section at the end on cycles and beginning to get into free energy and free energy transitions is essentially the topic of the next month. The next month, we're gonna be talking about free energies and enthalpies and entropies and what we can do with it. But initially, where does it come from? How do we use this? And how do we talk about this? And what are the things that we use to quantify and qualify free energies of interactions? Eventually, we'll build this right up to ligand binding, protein-protein interactions, conformational changes. We'll primarily use hemoglobin, the Mano wyman shanzhou problem. But we'll talk about binding interactions and how we use all of that to discuss energies of interactions, specificity of interactions. But we'll now get used to the context of enthalpic, entropic, free energy driving forces. OK. Um, the problem set is already out there. I'll repost the PowerPoint so you have my doodling on it, although you've got it from the movie. When I turn this off, of course, it'll produce a movie that I will then post again on YouTube once I have the opportunity. Do we have any questions? Okay, so next week we'll start with um, thermodynamics. I think the lecture material is partially posted. <clears throat> Am I right about that? Uh, not to Korea. Yep. No, I don't have a question, but um, did you post the lecture PowerPoint for um, last lecture lecture third i think yeah maybe i didn't actually move it out there you're right i think yeah yeah there's all the materials but not the powerpoint yep i'll go grab that powerpoint and move it out there because i did some doodling on it you're you're interested in that okay yeah thank you okay i'm looking out here and it looks like the next three posts are there they're listed under that general topic of thermodynamics and i think all that's there is a single copy uh, a single copy of the van hold pdf it's showing up it's actually opening it up for me Oh, I'm, am I actually in student view? I don't think I want to be in student view here. But in any event, <clears throat> I'll, I'll add some more to that as I need to. So that's where we're going. Uh, it looks like it's chapters out of the same book. They're actually different editions and different topics. <clears throat> and so we'll talk about that next week. Okay, anything else? All right, my goal in principle is to have assignments for you every week. Sometimes I don't finish topics. Uh, I think my goal is to try to be a little more organized and concise when I'm on the board in a lecture, I sometimes go over and uh, what says lecture five ends up being five and partial six, six and seven, seven and eight, et cetera. It tends to spread out. I'll try to constrain myself to any block, but I seldom do that. Especially that third one there, uh, would we get into some of the longer topics. Okay, so. Stop recording.